You don't have to do a formal post back to prove that to medical schools. And welcome to Ask Dr. Gray pre-med Q&A. How are you doing? I'm doing just dandy. Great. Staying alive. Happy New Year. Um, what can I answer for you today? So the question that I had was related to post back programs. Okay. So I've listened to a lot of your podcasts on um, just like the medical school personal statement. I even got the book. Because I was like, I really don't know how to write a personal statement after listening to the podcast. This one? <laughs> and um, yes, that's the one. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I was curious because I'm applying to post doc programs. Okay. I'm wondering if I should write the personal statement for my post doc program, like a medical school statement, or how does it differ? I would do them the same unless there's a a very specific prompt to where you wouldn't want them the same. So uh, depending on the school that you're applying to, a lot of post programs are now using what's very similar to a COMIS, uh, which is post CAS, uh, which is a centralized application service for post programs. It's run by the same company that runs a um centralized application service, a company called Liaison. Um, but the, the question is, what is the prompt asking? Do you know, uh, based on the school that you're applying to, what the prompt is? Or is it just a prompt- personal statement? It's, it's very vague. It's a personal statement, and they're just asking me to be reflective, which made me think that it, they want me to write it like as a medical school statement, yeah. just basically describing as a non-trad student, like, why am I following this path now? Yeah. D- does it specifically add that into it? Why, why are you following this path? Basically, that's the only question that they add. Yeah. It doesn't necessarily mean that's the question to be answered because yeah. it was like a little italicis yeah. of what yeah. the big question is. Yeah, I, I would basically write your medical school personal statement as your post back personal statement. Is there anything that you would suggest I should add in terms of... Um, potentially to, to kind of answer that one italicized prompt in terms of like, why now? Um, so potentially if that wasn't going to be part of your medical school personal statement, which it doesn't always have to be, I would maybe spend some time doing that in this personal statement. How many, Mm -hmm. how many characters or how many words do they give you? 5,000. Okay, so similar kind of character counts. So, yeah, yeah I, I think it's going to end up being very, very similar to your what, what your medical school personal statement will look like in a year or two. Mm-hmm. Okay, good. That's helpful because I was like, I just bought this book and I'm not even sure if I should do it this way. <laughs> you can. Yeah, the the book is really good, really, for um, learning how to be reflective, learning how to kind of find your story, um, and that's definitely going to help with with everything. Yeah. So the second question I have um, is still related to post back, and I know that you've done a couple of podcasts relating to post back. Yep. Um, but I'm in this moment where I'm not sure if I should pick a formal post back or a DIY post back. Okay. Let's, and, let's um, go through that process. Yeah. Why are you doing a post back to begin with? Uh, I would say more of just like proving it to myself that I can take on science courses. Okay. Or well, what um, was your undergraduate degree in? Psychology. Okay. So not super science heavy. Were you a pre-med in undergrad? I was for a short bit. So <laughs> my first until okay, ever. let me guess. <laughs> um, so my first year, um, I was biochem pre med. Okay. And then um I took pretty rigorous courses. So I crazy enough took biochem and lab and then calculus and English my freshman year. Okay. And so I really jam-packed it that first 
semester. And mm -hmm. then the next semester, I took more science courses. Okay. And then I was like, whoa, <laughs> I feel very overwhelmed. Okay. And I need to live life a little. So I took a break. Okay. Um, or I switched majors. Okay. Um, did you do, do poorly in those courses? Um, I did really well in pretty much all of those courses, except, um, what course was it? Gen Chem 2. Okay. Uh, it correlated with my dad being diagnosed with Hep C. Uh, I think it's, I think the proper terminology is stage four Hep C. Okay. So significant damage. And so that deteriorated with him going through chemo and all. Mm, okay. And then, um, just because I had to be for my, be there for my family a lot. Okay. And so that limp, that like put a little dent. As would and then be I had to, yeah. yeah. And then I audited my physics course. Okay. What's your GPA as of now? Um, I just graduated my. For undergrad, it's 3.49, and okay. then for grad, it's 3.75, but it's also not in a science. Okay. What are you doing for grad school? Um, master's in public health. Okay. And why are you doing that? So originally, I did public health. I wanted to go into social work, and my advisor so kindly was saying that maybe social work wasn't for me. Okay. And um, he said if I still had an interest in helping people that I should go into public health. Okay. And I was really offended um, that he suggested that because yeah. I was like, this is what I want to do, social work. Yeah. And um, so I was glad that he navigated me towards public health. Okay. And so I took a trip to Honduras way back in my freshman year that was really public health focused. And yep. I got to see and observe um just community health workers in the area and providing health education. Yep. And so it naturally warmed up to me and I was like, okay, maybe public health is not so bad. Maybe, maybe there's something into it that's like pretty precious and kind of beautiful seeing the community come together yep. for population health. Yeah. Okay. And so from a GPA perspective, it's on the lower side, not horrible, but on the lower side. Um, and so there, in my mind, the benefit of a formal post back is there's some potential prestige that goes along with that. There's some potential rigor that maybe is built into that, that medical schools may like more. I don't always buy into that. And I look more at kind of the whole picture of, did you do well? Did you not do well? And I think a big part of it is finances. A big part of it is other time commitments. What is what does your schedule look like? Is a formal post back flexible enough for you? Or do you need to do a do-it-yourself post back to kind of pick and choose your courses and times and, and, and all of that stuff? Um, obviously, financially, formal post backs are much more expensive Um than a do-it-yourself postback. The one other benefit that a formal postback gives you is usually there's some built-in advising in and around the pre-med world because the whole point of a formal postback is to have that kind of built-in support there for you. And so if you think you need that, if you think you want that, then look at formal postbacks. If you don't think you need that and you're you're structured enough and organized enough on your own, disciplined enough on your own to, to pick and choose the courses you need, to figure it all out, to take them, to do well in them, then I don't think there's any need to do a formal postback. Now, the, the academic world doesn't like me saying that because the academic world makes a lot more money on formal postbacks, uh, but there's plenty of students out there doing those anyway. Yeah, and so I think maybe me going towards the formal postback is like rooted in trying to like prove to, you know, the medical school or when I find a medical school that I can withstand um, a course load. Yeah. And I'm not so much like, that's why I didn't want to choose a DIY because I was like, oh, well, I can technically take like these amount of credits this semester and these amount of credits this semester whereas yeah. the post back is like you take pretty set 
pretty much a full yeah. load. Yeah. But you can do that for a do-it-yourself post back as well at a fraction of the cost. So, yeah. so you can take a rigorous course load at a do-it-yourself program, whether whatever institution that's at, and still prove academically by getting as close to a 4.0 as possible that you can handle the rigors mm -hmm. of medical school. You don't have to do a formal post back to prove that to medical schools. Would I, so, cause I kind of want to lean towards the DIY program just because of finances, it is costly to go to a post back. Yeah. And then, you know, I already have my MPH. So I'm like, I have to pay off that student loan. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so I think my next question was, how would you recommend me to show academic rigor get a, um, get that a, I can handle? Get a 4.0. Get a 4.0? <laughs> yeah. Get, 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 get good grades. <laughs> I, I, think, I think there's a lot of uh, question marks and a lot of kind of mythology and misunderstanding about what proving academic rigor is. Like if you get a 4.0, you have a 4.0. That's that's proving it right there. They're not going to mm -hmm. then pick it apart and go, well, it was a do yourself post back. Well, it was 10 hours instead of 12 hours, right? They're not going to get into the weeds. Like you have a 4.0, you have a 4.0. Now, obviously, mm -hmm. if it took you five years to do your post back, taking one class a semester, that kind of goes out the window, <laughs> right? So obviously, yeah. there's some common sense built into that, uh, into that logic. But I think you asking the question and you being concerned about it at this point makes me assume that you're going to be perfectly fine because you know what you need to do. And that is take as many courses as will fit into your schedule, both financially and time wise. And, and you will, you will get it done and, and do well in them. Uh, a lot of students who aren't asking this question, which is a good question to ask are the ones who are out there going, well, I'm non-trad, I have a family, I can only fit in one course, so that's just what I'm going to do. And they won't ask the question, is that a bad thing or not? So mm -hmm. I, I think you understanding that there may be some negative perception of not taking enough courses, not proving yourself academic, uh, academically, that that may be an issue, I don't think you'll have that issue because you're thinking about that already. Okay. I'm trying to think of another question because I didn't think I was going to go through them so quick. <laughs> I was like, I don't have anything together. Because <laughs> um, now I, my whole thing was revolved around applying for a post -bac program, mm -hmm. but now I feel like I've gained some confidence that doing a DIY program is totally okay. Because I thought that it would be nitpicky. I thought they would be like, well, technically, at <laughs> the 36 degrees Celsius, <laughs> so yes. you had this, that, and the third. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's not that big of an issue. Like, ho holistic, the whole holistic review is true, right? They, they're going to look at you holistically. They're going to look at you big picture, and they're not going to go down into the micro and go, well, this semester you did this, and that semester you did this, and that doesn't look good, and this doesn't look good. And, and at the end of the day, you did your post back. You got however many credits you got. You got as close to a 4.0 as possible, and you didn't do one class a semester. You'll, you'll be fine. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> you are welcome. Anything else? I'm trying to think of something, but like. So, so let's, that, let's carry tumbled. on. So if you were to do a do-it-yourself post back, how would you determine where you would do that? Um, I actually live right next to a public college. Okay. That so helps. it's right there and yep. the school's like literally four minutes away. Yeah. And, um, have you looked so, into what it's like to, to take classes as a non-degree seeking student there? I have not. Okay. So I didn't be next know, steps. look into like how non-degree seeking. I have been looking at the application process of applying as a non-degree seeking student. And it's really like the last minute to apply. And it's like the application isn't open. So that's made me a little bit yeah. leaning towards the formal post back because I'm like, I'm not even going to get the right class. The section. classes. That's the one yeah. downfall to, depending on the institution, to non-degree seeking students. And, and 
literally just had another conversation with a student um, about her looking at a non-degree seeking kind of course load at the institution. And you couldn't register for the courses as a non-degree seeking student until the first day of classes, right? And it's like, well, the classes are already full by then, typically, especially yeah. for those heavier kind of science courses where every freshman is like, I'm a pre-med, I want to be a doctor. Um, ah. And so, <laughs> and they and, all hit organic chemistry yeah. and they're like, yeah, never mind. I just not. Mind. Yeah, maybe social work. That's what I want to do. Oh, there um, you go. Yep. <laughs> so, so there, there are some loopholes, right? And and you could say, oh, I'm going back to do a biology degree, and now you are a degree seeking student. Now you do have the privileges of registering before non degree seeking students, where hopefully classes are available. And then you just drop out when you're done with classes, right? Mm -hmm. You're like, ah, just kidding, right? You pull a fast one on them. Um, those loopholes are silly because they're there. Uh, and mm -hmm. so why why punish non-degree seeking students in the first place? I don't know. Yeah. Um, that made me think of another question was as a non-degree, I only have organic one and two or the one and two and okay. then physics one and two okay. to take. Okay. And then. I don't know. I know that there's another course that they suggest. Um, and typically that was biochemistry, if I'm not mistaken. You should definitely take biochem, yeah. especially for the MCAT. Yeah. Yep. So it'd be like those four courses. Is there another course you would suggest? I, I, I just would, want to make sure that I'm prepared yeah, for I the would, MCAT. I would for your GPA to have as upward of a GPA as possible. Um, I would mm -hmm. just take like a microbiology or, or other courses, right? Anatomy and physiology, other courses that count as science courses that aren't maybe technically prereqs, but will count towards your science courses and help your overall GPA and science GPA more specifically. Yeah. Okay. That works. I feel pretty golden. I'm sorry. Yeah. I didn't have anything else. <laughs> That's all right. That's good. Well, good luck to you. Hopefully this was helpful and we'll get you on your, your path to getting to medical school. Yeah. Thank you. I, thanks. I actually really appreciate it. <laughs>